Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the first WCET webcast of 2023. We're thrilled you can join us for today's webcast, Tangible Strategies and Emerging Opportunities, Digital Learning Leaders' Hopes for 2023. Um, we'd like to ask you to take a moment to introduce yourselves in the chat and let us know where you're joining from. I'm in Boulder, Colorado, and it's thankfully very sunny today. Um, we're happy to see the sun back after a few cloudy days. My name is Kim Naraki, Assistant Director for Events and Programs at WCET. We'll put a link to the slides in chat um, in a few minutes, and you can download those if you like. Um, as we go through the webinar today, if you have any questions, please enter them into the question box, and we'll get to them during the Q&A portion. If you put your questions in chat, we often lose track of them. You can follow the Twitter back channel using hashtag WCET webcast. We are recording and we'll share that with you by next week. Um, I'd like to introduce today's moderator, for, who is um, again Raymond, WCET's Senior Director, Director of Programs and Membership. Take it away, Megan. Great, thank you, Kim. And I just saw a note that the chat is disabled. So if we can enable that, please, then we can go ahead and ask some questions to our audience members as well to see where they're checking in from today. So again, I'm the Senior Director of Membership and Programs here at WCET. I've been here a long, long time. And one of the favorite parts of my job is that I get to talk with people doing amazing student-focused work across the United States. And we have several of those friends with us today. So I'd like to go ahead and ask them to do some self-introductions. Next slide, please. We'll start with the left and move to the right. So Leah, would you like to do an introduction, please? Sure. Hi, everybody. This is Leah Matthews. I'm from the Distance Education Accrediting Commission, where I've been the executive director for the last 10 years. I've really enjoyed my affiliation with WCET. I currently serve on the executive council, and previously I have served on the steering committee and one year as chair. Delightful to be with you today. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Leah and John. Good afternoon, everybody, or more afternoon here. Uh, John Opera from Florida Virtual Campus. Uh, I've been working in this field, uh, certainly with the Florida Virtual Campus and its previous organizations for probably more than 20 years. Uh, it is beautifully sunny in Florida, a little chilly today, uh, and, uh, but uh, we're hopeful that we'll have a few more days of cool weather before the summer heat hits us. Happy to be here. Oh, I'd love some summer heat. I was just looking into the weather in Boulder, and we're going to have a high of 11 on Monday. Oh. Yeah, I need to come to Florida and visit. And Shantae. Hi, everyone. I'm Shantae Rikasner. I, um, I'm currently the equity research manager on the advanced analytics team at Western Governors University. Um, I've al I'm also a member of the steering committee for WCET. I'm vice chair of the steering committee. I'm always happy to be a part of these kinds of conversations and I'm grateful for being a panelist and looking forward to the talk. Thank you. Oh, I'm in San Antonio. It's warm and well, warm-ish for San Antonio, but it's sunny and beautiful in Texas right now. Great. Thank you. And Jessica from Georgia. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Jessica Roland Williams, Director of Every Learner Everywhere, which is a network of organizations that help institutions to implement digital learning strategies, specifically in ways that support student success for Black, Latinx, Indigenous, poverty-affected, and first-generation students. Um, we focus on um, helping students get through their gateway courses so that they can graduate and go on to be successful in college. Um, it is an honor to be here with this incredible panel, and I look forward to the discussion. Great, thank you everybody. So this will just be a, a fun conversation and we hope that the audience participates too. So if you have any thoughts or reactions to the questions that we use for discussion today, please enter them into the chat and then be sure to add your questions. I'll be keeping an eye on the Q&A and we'll ask your questions of our panelists. So this really is, um, you know, not, a, not a necessarily a predictions webinar. I think there's several of those that take place each year, but really it's a reflection on the past year what was successful, what felt good to you in your work in higher education and what you hope to do um, over the following year. So if you have thoughts about that in the audience, please go ahead and enter that into the chat. We'd like to hear, um, you know, what your, your opportunities, your challenges, and your successes were. 
So let's go ahead and kick this off. Um, I'd like to hear from each of our panelists. As you reflect on 2022, what practical and student-centered strategies worked and, and what really made a difference for learners? Let's start with you, Jessica. Yeah, happy to answer that question. So one thing that um, our network, Every Learner Everywhere did was we recently released a um, resource called what our best college instructors do, where we talked to students and asked them basically that, that exact question, right? Um, what worked, what didn't work, what, what, when you think of a good faculty member or a good instructor, you know, what does that mean? And um, I'm happy to put that resource in the chat or someone on my team can. Um, and I can tell you that a lot of the reflections from our students really came around to, came down to, um, instructors actually seeing students as individuals and um, seeing them as real humans and seeing them as people and being willing to engage with them and interact with them on that level. Um, so, you know, one of the things that I see working in higher ed that has been a shift more recently is really humanizing the learning experience and um, creating opportunities for, um, you know, there to be connections based on you know, individual experiences and um, starting to share that, that having more shared learning experiences where instructor, where we're breaking down that stage on the stage, you know, dynamic in the classrooms and beginning to um, allow students to bring more of themselves um, to the learning experience and engage from that, from that place. Excellent, thank you. Does someone else wanna to react to that or answer the question about what, what did you do that was successful in student-centered? I'll speak to um, an initiative DEAC implemented over uh, the end of 21 and 22. We were really intentional, intentional about bringing conversations about mental health for students into our, our dialogue as an accreditor. And we held sessions through webinars with a speaker. His name is Dr. Perry Francis who is a researcher and counselor and expert on mental health in the student context in higher learning, just wanted to raise awareness that coming out of the pandemic, uh, we had students with um, learning losses, students that had fallen behind in their studies, uh, were coping with a lot of uh, stressful incidents in their life. And so we wanted to offer training to our institutions and their faculty and their staff on recognizing those indicators, how to mitigate them and how to support students um, as we're coming out of this very unusual three-year period where distance education was relied upon for access, affordability, and input into student learning. Uh, we have some resources on our website, so anybody can visit our website. You can see some recorded webinars on this topic, and uh, we think it's been a very productive um, activity on the part of an accreditor who plays lots of different interesting roles in working with our institutions. Thank you, Leah. I would say that um, thinking back over, you know, in the pandemic, we had the big shift. Everybody talks about that. And but but we learned a lot from that. And over the last year, we've seen students really gravitate toward or appreciate the flexibility and in instructional delivery that we currently offer. There was a big discussion about, oh, they're going to all come back to campus after the pandemic. And some did. Uh, but we still have online and blended enrollments that are much higher than they were pre-pandemic. And I think that 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 flexibility that we're offering students is really meaning a lot to them. The other thing that that really has worked is um, we lost some students. We, we seem to lose them and we were concerned about that. And a lot of our institutions actually divided up student names among their faculty and they made personal phone calls to students. And that engagement, that reaching out to students really made a difference. I think communicated to the student that this institution cares about me, this institution cares about my progress, they know who I am. And that translated back into, I think, better performance on the part of the students and it brought some enrollment numbers back. So as we look into some enrollment declines that we're certainly experiencing here in Florida and our colleges, um, that personal and student engagement is really something that seems to be working and helping. Fantastic, thank you, John. Shantae? 
Yeah, so um, I'm going to take off from Jessica's comment about humanizing our work. So as a national serving enterprise, right? So we are 100% online um, and competency based. I think where WGU is sort of making strides to um, provide the greatest support in students and is how we're actually approaching our our data analytics, right? Humanizing data analytics, really thinking about who's impacted by these numbers, who's represented by these numbers, um, thinking about ways to um, intersect our intelligence about data analytics and equity um, and building such a team, like building out our equity research team. Um, that's a combination of people with a multifaceted skill set um, that allows us to actually build richer profiles of the students who we're trying to serve. We're really committed to this idea of um, personalizing the learning experience for each one of our students, um, which is ambitious and noble um, and heavy. It's a heavy lift, um, but really thinking about ways that we, uh, again, um, I can't emphasize the, the fact enough that in online institutions, we lose sight of the humanity of our students as they track through our systems quite frequently. Um, so I think really paying attention to at the core, how we're measuring our success, how we're thinking about what we're doing um, and, and broadening our definitions, our definitions of analytics to include the student voices, to include those sort of qualitative inputs as well. Um, I think that's been um, a strength of our organization in terms of responding to what students need in this moment um, in the shifting landscape of higher ed. Excellent. And there's been some comments in the chat that mirror what others are seeing. And they were anticipating this rush back to the campus. And then really it's been a, a quite a shift and it's probably a permanent shift where digital learning really has a chance to shine. You know, there was so much movement to remote learning and now it's hey, how do we do this well and how do we serve our students really effectively in a digital learning environment? So I know it's been a challenging couple of years as you're trying to figure out the, the mix of what faculty preferences are and student preferences are, um, but it seems like we're heading, heading in the right direction and hopefully we can retain those students. So as we look to 2023, uh, what do you plan to implement this year or build on that you already talked about? What's a big challenge you hope to tackle? Let's take that one first. So I'll I'll go first and and quickly. Like I think one of the major efforts that we're trying to do right now is to 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 build a sort of uh, engage artificial intelligence actually to help us um, to to help us personalize the student's journey, right? Um, and What's impressive, I think, for such a huge enterprise is that we're pulling people from various sectors of the organization to actually talk about the input in the build. Um, that's so critical, especially from an ethical and equitable standpoint. Like, it's so important to talk about what goes into the build and who's a part of the conversation. I'm excited to hear, you know, to be able to say that in our considerations of this, we're talking about how do we get students involved in this conversation, which is so um, it can feel like such a, an, a difficult task um, when you're a completely online institution, but, but we recognize the value in that, so that's really important. So um, really excited about that, but also continuing to grow our, our understandings and our capacities for what it means to sort of measure equity success. Um, I think this is still such a nebulous construct. Um, how, do we, how do we measure an organization's successful commitment to equity? Um, I think there are so many different spaces that, that people are trying this out and trying that out, and we've not standardized this practice. So I think continuing to play in that space and being innovative and, and having the bandwidth to explore and experiment around these kinds of concepts, I think, is, is going to serve the institution well in the future. Excellent. I'm, and mm -hmm. if it's OK, I'm going to ask Jessica to respond because I'm a little familiar with some of the work taking place at Every Learner Everywhere and might tie nicely in. Absolutely. I mean, I, I just, I think that what Shantae has already said is an incredible direction to go. I can just add to that and say, you know, one of the things that we have been intentional about is um, ending the monolithic view of students, particularly students of color, um, even within that, that demographic, right? We know that like all Black students are not the same, all Indigenous students are not the same, and there are all types of um, ways that 
identity is constructed and um, all of those things play into a student's experience. And so um, we've done a lot of work around um, trying to break that down and specifically think about what that means for a student's experience with digital learning. Um, we, you know, not to keep tooting all of our resources, but we actually recently published a report on, it was actually called Towards Ending the Monolithic View of, um, it's it's going to be in the chat, you'll, you'll see it. Um, there it is, uh, underrepresented students. Um, and so we encourage you to read that, but that's something that we want to continue to, to build on and deepen our knowledge um, when it comes to how we serve specific student types um, and what adjustments we need to make and how we're thinking about policies and practices um, that we're implementing at the institutional level to best serve these institution types because it's not the same and it really does depend on the context and the students within the institution. Um, and so, you know, that's just something that that we're really focused on bringing to light and continuing to build on over the next year. Thank you, Jessica. Hmm. Leah, did you want to go ahead? Well, you know, building on this idea of better understanding our students, I think needs attention to the data and something at DEAC we've been concerned about is whether we're disaggregating our data enough to really understand how students are being positioned and their studies being served appropriately. Uh, we're launching at the DEAC an Office for Institutional Research where we've brought some experts and data analytics together to work directly with our schools on how they're gathering data, um, how they're analyzing it, uh, how um, it's being used to present institutional effectiveness in meeting their mission. And uh, if we're going to better serve um, our underrepresented students, I think we need to really target and understand who they are and, and look at our data more carefully and more purposefully. Um, so we've been, just as an accreditor function, how can we help this improve and support this among the online institutions that are accredited with DEAC? So I, I really enjoy that work uh, that I'm hearing about from, from both of you. It's really quite fantastic. So. I would sort of take a little different tack in the sense that we, <clears throat> uh, here, uh, we work primarily with not directly with students, uh, except on the periphery, but we work primarily with people on the campuses who are in charge of operating online learning programs or online student support programs. And um, one of the things that we're going to try to do is take a page from WCET uh, and uh, take a look at their mix platform, because what we see is a tremendous need for support on the part of people who are on the campus level who are operating online learning programs that are just so many things that they need to keep in front of them. Uh, not only quality issues around their courses, there's state authorization issues, there are professional licensure issues, there are all sorts of federal policies. Um, there's all the new emerging technologies as well as the ongoing operational things that they have to deal with every day. And I think they feel like very much that they're standing in the middle of a education climate crisis of their own. And I think we want to try to set up something like Mix so that they can collaborate with each other, they can support each other, they can share documents, they can share policies, they can um, um, just vent uh, if they need to or call somebody. Uh, we see a tremendous amount of, cons uh, of stress. And we also are concerned about where are we getting that next that next group of people who are gonna step up, be those e-learning leaders and how are they developed? And right now we're trying to see who can we mentor? How can we do that? So I think in the sort of uh, chaos that we seem to be in right now as we come out of COVID and we emerge into what is now and keeps changing, it's very dynamic for us. Uh, and we fight the usual de enrollment declines and everything else. We feel the need to support them and um, help them. And we certainly, um, uh, appreciate the effort that WCET provides to us and everyone does, but we think they need to be able to connect with themselves. And so we're going to try and work on that very hard this year. Thank you. I, I would agree. There, there seems to be more um, attention to needing to have small group discussions where people can sort of share and just connect because those connection pieces and points have been missing. 
I think there was a point where everyone was on Zoom and then they were just, they didn't want any more meetings or Zooms on their calendar. And now that we're sort of past that, uh, that tipping point, I think there's more chance for people to just reflect and, and share their experiences. And that's why Mix has been very, very active. And I think a lot of that is gonna um, tie into our the next question for the panelists, but uh, there's, there's a lot going on and there's a lot that's going to happen this year. Um, and so a lot of our work here has been reactive to the chat GPT and AI, and I'm sure many of you feel that same way, but that's why these small group communities, I think are so critical right now is that people can say, hey, this is what I'm dealing with. What have you learned? What are you, what are you doing? Um, because it's not just at a state level or an institution level, it is, it is across the whole, uh, the whole community. So, Along that, John, I, I know this is a, a topic of interest to you, and I'm sure everyone else has an opinion and wants to weigh in, but what are some of the emerging technologies that you're eager to dive in or try and uh, figure out and confront this year? So you want to start with that, John? I certainly can. Uh, so many of you know, and I've talked with a lot of you about this, uh, probably about four or five years ago, I became concerned that I felt like e-learning was kind of stagnating, that all the the virtual learning platforms were the same. All the video conferencing was the same. There wasn't 5% of difference between them. Um, and I was looking for the next thing. What's the next thing going to be? And I maybe it's chat GPT. Um, you know, we talked about AI for a long time, but then when we got publicly available AI for everybody to play with, that changed the game a little bit. And so this earlier this year, we've heard a lot about the metaverse as well. But I didn't really see that yet. I mean, I've I've played in it. I have it. Many of you probably have as well. But I'm having trouble seeing where that's going to go. And then in October, I taught. I was in a meeting, uh, a, a conference with uh, the chairman of uh, the CEO of Accenture. Seven hundred and twenty-one thousand employees, and they do all their professional development in the metaverse. That shocked me. I wasn't prepared for somebody like Accenture to say that they have made a multi-million dollar investment in the metaverse and that's their platform. <clears throat> so I think the, the obvious outtake was that was what's going to move the metaverse forward is collaboration. Um, and so I'm going to be really interested to see where that goes. But ChatGPT has really just shaken things up a little bit. And it's opened a very interesting conversation for me, which is what is learning? What is learning going to be in the classroom? It used to be memorization of facts, and, and but this is something different. This is a set of tools that learners have access to, like the internet was, um, and we kind of changed what learning was. Uh, certainly, if I were doing a dissertation today, not only now writing a dissertation today, that whole exercise might be a different exercise than it was when I did it. So I think this is going to change the nature of a lot of questions we ask. It's not just about chat GPT itself, but I think it's opening us to broader questions about what is learning and what is it going to look like as more of these technologies come up. But certainly chat GPT is very interesting. I played with it. I put in some very good statistical questions that I pulled off a stat test that I took and actually gave. And the answers were surprisingly good. Uh, now, I didn't ask it for references. I understand it's fond of giving fake references. But as my brother has told me, and he's in this field, it will only get smarter. Yeah. Well, you know, John, yesterday I was at the Council for Higher Education Accreditation, CHIA's conference, and they've been meeting for two days. And a lot of the discussion was around this issue and academic integrity. And what do we need to do as educators, as accreditors, to be looking at these new technologies uh, through the lens of, you know, the, the integrity of the student work product? Uh, we don't have the answers. We look to maybe all of you for the answers. And this could be another WCET, you know, activity in terms of the, the research that it does into these topics. But John, it had everybody buzzing at Chia yesterday um, and how we're going to be dealing with evaluating student learning in these contexts. So that's that's a very good point that you said, Leah. I think the whole question for me is about assessment. Mm -hmm. um, how are we going to evaluate and assess a student so that we know that it is the student learning and not something else? And what is an authorized assistance on the part of a class? So I think what we don't do very well, at least 
we, we haven't done very well is we have a lot of uh, efforts to help faculty learn how to teach online and build good quality mm -hmm. courses, mm -hmm. but we don't pay a lot of attention about how to construct good assessment and approach mm -hmm. assessment. And I think that's probably gonna be a real future topic for faculty development programs in terms of creating assessments that are authentic right. and really test right. the student. Right, we've spent a lot of effort on student identity, right? Mm -hmm. And that has been something that has been a major focus of accreditation is how are you identifying students that we have to take further steps. I'm sorry, please go ahead. Oh no, I was just gonna add a, to, to think about our, our definition of learning is shifting, but our definition of higher education is shifting, right? So like, what do higher education organizations look like? And I think, you know, the, the sort of memo here, and we don't have to stay down this path at all, but like the memo for leaders is being prepared to lead in a space where um, it is no longer uh, enough to, to avoid uh, to think about education as something siloed from business, for instance, um, particularly as it relates to engaging in tech entrepreneurial um, kind of spaces. Like, you know, I just I just think whether or not you're in a brick and mortar institution, you know, it the the lanes and the avenues and the strategies, the modems, uh, the mediums by which the media by which we access learning and engage learning, it's it's. It's becoming so sophisticated and um, multi-dynamic that uh, we've got to think about even in brick and mortar spaces, how to engage um, learning in all the varied spaces that you've accounted for, John. So it's just something to think about from a, a leadership standpoint as well. And, and not to pile out, I don't, I don't wanna go down too far down this rabbit hole, but I, I just wanna add that from an equity perspective, I think a question I have not heard asked that I, I wish would enter into the conversation is, who's being privileged and who's being penalized by the use of AI? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's a new digital divide. I think what we what we consider technological literacy used to be just using a keyboard. Now it's more about, do you understand that this is AI? Do you understand that it's, is it AI? Is it not? How do you use it? What, when do you use it? If you don't, you know, there's a whole conversation about chat GPT and how they, they hope to monetize it. Okay, great. But if we have only those who can pay, have access to it, then we're talking about a whole nother the digital divide of a different kind. Yeah. Um, so that's a problem. And that's the end user issue, right? But then the build issue, I think, is what we're trying to address. Who's involved in the build? Um, who's who's creating with the, the appropriate code to capture X, right? So I think that's Great point, Jessica. That's all I can say. It's a great point. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I, don't, I don't know about this chat GPT, I think, because I have a, a very precocious 10 year old. I'm a little frightened about <laughs> what this means. Um, Kim put a link to a blog that Van Davis created for us about AI and he used chat GPT to write. A poem from a cat's perspective. So I encourage you to get in there and read that if you haven't yet. It's pretty entertaining. Um, so as, as we talk about technology, there's always data and privacy and security concerns. So how can we truly help our students be proactive stewards of their data? And what can institutions do to minimize their risk? And who wants to start with that one? I mean, I'll jump in. I think part of Part of it is creating a, a sense of intelligence around data, like data literacy at institutions has been like sort of, and I'm gonna use this word very intentionally, like ghettoized to a particular unit, right? So like this team understands institutional data. Um, there are so many units outside of, you know, including students, but faculty don't have the kind of data intelligence that they should have um, in terms of understanding what's happening with their work, how their work is assessed in terms of how the, the, their work's impact on students. Um, so actually creating greater access to data intelligence generally at organizations, I think is where we need to go. But for an organization like us, a very specific strategy is ensuring that students have capacity to um, to opt out, um, that's that's a very important small thing that we have to talk about all the time as we provide services in online spaces. There are ways that, you know, we take for granted that, you know, when students decide that they want to engage in a digital inter interface that 
almost like they, they're giving us permissions to everything associated with them. And that is not what people are doing intuitively, right? And so our intelligence on the back end says that, you know, we've put something, we have to make sure we're not fine printing it. So we work very heavily um, with from our equity research team, we work with our marketing team, we work with other teams in our organization to make sure that the students always have a say in what's being collected about them um, and, and they are able to opt out. Um, the, the sort of enrollment piece that enables a sort of default opting in is fine, but just, you know, in, in the same way that we protect human subjects in research, you wanna make sure that the opt out option is always available and is always clear um, how to access that, being transparent about that, um, making sure that that's as visible and readily um, attained information as possible. I think that's a starting point for, um, for honoring students' capacities to be the drivers of their own experience um, in whatever environment. It's, it's just very complicated to try to even keep your eye on the ball in terms of how much data is being shared and in, inadvertently shared, not only when students do it on their own, but, but when they do anything like buy a textbook. Uh, the idea that textbook companies are, are collecting data all the time behind the scenes on usability and uh, the lab sessions and all that, all of that is going on in the, and, and the institution can try very hard to, to keep track of that. It's very difficult. There's just so much of it nowadays, so much. And there's actually, there's also data out there that's being used for purposes that it was not intended to be used for. That's what scares me the most. Um, being able to combine multiple data sets that were never intended to be combined to create new, new, new insights that people have no idea uh, that, that can be done. I, I think there are, there are some discussions I'm aware of where institutions are essentially adding uh, riders to every contract they have that give them access to control or at least some control over any data that is collected because what you could end up with is a vendor that has a product that doesn't collect data, but down the road it does, uh, somewhere down the road, and you just don't know. It's kind of like everybody's experience with Facebook. You thought you had your security and privacy settings set, and then they changed the platform again. And last week, uh, they've changed it. Now you have to update something. It's, it's very difficult. Okay, I didn't see anybody else come off a of mute. Anybody else eager to answer the question about security and privacy access? I think ditto to everything that was already said. I think the only other thing I'll add is that I think there is a um, mistrust, a long history of mistrust, particularly between communities of color and, um, you know, technology, the, the folks that are in power behind tech systems of technology. And there also has been this history of using technology in ways that ultimately harm communities of color. And we've seen that in banking, we've seen that in criminal justice. Um, and it's, you know, it, it's, you know, we're seeing it in education, um, although we haven't really done a good job of documenting and tracking how it's happening. And so I think it's just important to be aware um, that, you know, I know Shantae alluded to kind of the, the bias that's built into te te technology already, um, and just always kind of keep that at the forefront of the conversation. Um, these are real things that are happening. This is not just, you know, like some imaginary thing. And so, and so what does that mean, you know, as we continue to introduce new platform, technology platforms into the educational system? Like, what does that mean for different populations? And, you know, like I said, are we inadvertently harming students in the process and how do we continuously make sure that we're um, being accountable for that harm and measuring that harm um, if it exists. I think that's such a good point, Jessica. And I think, you know, not only recognizing like the, I, the, the, the population specifically within the student group, but just the idea of like that relationship between student and faculty or student and institution. So the ways our inst institutions have historically leaned on a sort of they need us 
um, kind of paradigm about, uh, you know, a great savior, right? Institutions as saviors um, of people, um, higher education institutions, especially as saviors of, of people. Um, I think that's a power dynamic that needs to be recalibrated um, when we're talking about students being stewards of their own, right? We're talking about a certain kind of agency. We're talking about a certain kind of respect for persons that has to exist before we start building and thinking about you know, students as stewards, right? And as agents. And and I think we're still working through that. I think that there are spaces where we see great evidence of a sort of critical pedagogy framework of, you know, everyone is empowered in this space. And then there are other spaces where we consistently talk about students as if they are not agents of their own lives, as if they need us and you know, and they can only be successful with us. That, that sort of paternalistic, if not sometimes outrightly racist um, <laughs> kind of notions. So I think that's a power dynamic that has been ingrained in what we call this institution of education that we're often competing with, right? So then what, is that, what does that look like in strategy planning conversations? What does that look like in student success development strategy, you know, conversations? Um, who has the power and, and how are we thinking about power? So. Excellent. Thank you. So I'm going to move us on to our favorite topic, everyone's favorite topic, I'm sure. The 2023 reauthorization of the Higher Education Act. Woohoo! So this always keeps us busy here at WCET. So Leah, I know you've been heavily involved in negotiated rulemaking previously. And what do you expect will affect institutions this year and what needs to be on their radar? Well, what I expect is that we will not see a reauthorization of the Higher Education Act anytime soon, given the polarization in Congress um, and their inability to even do minor pieces of legislation, uh, the massive, massive effort that reauthorization re of HEA entails is, is probably unlikely. And because of that, um, our Department of Education takes things into its own hands. And that is through uh, negotiated rulemaking. And negotiated rulemaking is a process whereby the law, Higher Education Act, is uh, implemented through federal regulations. The Code of Federal Regulation Book 34 is sort of the guiding book for higher education. Uh, the department a couple of weeks ago announced that it was going to hold negotiated rulemaking sessions and included in their list distance education and state authorization. Uh, Russ Poulon and I served on a negotiated rulemaking group in 2019 that reached consensus around some of the language we had questions about in the statute, particularly regular and substantive interaction. Uh, but I'm thinking about the conversation we're having today and how we're so much more now than regular and substantive interaction. We really have to deal with some of these emerging issues in higher education. And does it still make sense to bifurcate our higher education system into a part that is distance education and a part that is other kinds of instruction on campus. So there, there's a lot of work to be done, but I don't know if negotiated rulemaking is the solution at this point. I'd also like to mention that we reached consensus on a package of rules that were published in 2020. And reaching that consensus on that regulatory framework was a, a tremendous achievement. Uh, achieving consensus is very rare. And so to see the department headed in a direction of new rulemaking uh, kind of asks the question about where their priorities might be, given that we have language that all parties kind of agreed to and implementing. So it, it'll be interesting. They, they are quite ambitious. Um, they intend to hold the session soon. They have to hit a November 1, 2023 deadline of publication in order for any change to be implemented the following year on July 1, 2024. So it's ambitious and I'll be watching to see what happens, perhaps not raising my hand this time around to be a part of it all. <laughs> well, we really appreciate the work that you and Russ did. And if I remember correctly, Russ didn't have any gray hairs going into that. So he, he did not. Uh, we are both recovering from our experience. <laughs> well. We're expecting something to come out from the department in late March or early April. So mm -hmm. we'll be sure to keep you all informed, follow our blog. Mm -hmm. uh, Don, I don't, you're off the mute, but I don't know that you want to touch anything political where you sit in Florida. 
Uh, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, come on, John, tell us. <laughs> I don't, I don't, uh, I don't have anything that I can say. So uh, for some of you may know, Florida, we have a number of things going on right now that have concerned uh, a lot of faculty and a lot of accreditors and a lot of different folks. Uh, many of you know that we, the legislation was passed that requires all of our institutions to seek a new accreditor um, once they come up for a reaccreditation. So they are attempting to do that in mass and they are moving forward on that. But the bottom line is that they, at the end, they can do that for a few years and they have to switch accreditors again. So if you're an accreditor, you're, you're taking on a temporary lodger. Uh, so it's an interesting situation. Um, we also have a number of things going on with um, um, curriculum and content, the concerns about content. And most recently, we have uh, concerns about one of our smaller universities, New College, which is down in Sarasota, who um, the governor has appointed um, um, some new board, um, board, new trustees, and they want to uh, talk about uh, changing the curriculum of that institution to be more classical. Classical education is what they're saying. So we're going to see where all of this ends up, but it's uh, it's quite dynamic in Florida right now in terms of higher education. I think that is our governor who was just reelected. Uh, that is his focus for this session. So we'll see what comes out of that. Exciting times. Okay, well, we just have a couple more questions here, but I'd love the audience to add any questions that they'd like me to ask. So if you can put those in the Q&A or feel free to share your own comments in the chat there. Um, but yeah, this is a great group of people. I encourage you to put your question in and share that with the, the panelists. Um, so 2022, you know, there was a lot that we had hoped going into 2022. I think we said post-pandemic numerous, numerous times and then surprise wasn't quite post-pandemic. Uh, but as you look back at 2020, at 2022, which was less than a month ago, but feels much longer in some ways, what was more hype than help for learners in your mind? What did you think was going to help really move the needle that might have been just overly hyped? Anybody want to chime in on that? I'll start, and we already alluded to this, but I think going back to the classroom. <laughs> Right. And I think the reason being, I think, um, and I, you know, I don't want to make a blanket statement there, but I do think that, um, I think that we had an opportunity to focus on um, developing intentionally designed, you know, digital learning platforms and courses. Um, and I think some institutions certainly took advantage of that. But I think, unfortunately, there were some that kind of said, hey, we just want to get back to the classroom as quickly as possible. Um, and, you know, scrap the, you know, online or, you know, digital components of um, our engagement with students, um, or at least not put an, an intentionality behind um, designing those in ways that best serve students. And um, I think that was a missed opportunity. And, and again, that's not, not all institutions, but I, I think that what's actually happening, as the panel has already highlighted, is that you know our students are diverse and our students have diverse needs and they want different they want options when it comes to modalities for learning and so I think that as we move into 2023 it's going to be important that we ensure quality across all modalities period um, I, I don't think that you know just focusing on classroom learning is the solution I think that we need to offer online and hybrid options that are as high quality as you know being in person. And I think the other thing that we've lost sight of in the pandemic and sort of even in this year is I think we've had a fairy tale uh, mentality around in-person learning. And I think we forgot that in-person learning actually didn't serve all students well to begin with, right? And so I, I also think that as we're shifting back to in-person learning, that we have to remember that we have to continue to push faculty, push institutions, on redesigning those spaces to better serve those to better serve all students, um, because you know there were there were some inequities there too, pre-pandemic, right? And so as we're post-pandemic or wherever we are, I don't even know where we are at this point. Um, I think our focus really just has to be on designing quality learning experiences across all modalities. 
I no, uh, go ahead. Go ahead, Leah. I'm oh, sorry, John. Um, I've been following the hype over the last year around OPM and a, a lot of traction in the news media. Some think tanks are writing about the OPM marketplace, uh, the investor involvement through OPM. And I think it generates a lot of confusion about their role, about how they support institutions that are looking to grow their online programs and serve students. So I really think we have to have a lens from a quality assurance standpoint on how those partnerships are effectively working to support universities that want to offer more robust online learning and platforms and, and how we can take this opportunity in our growing knowledge about OPMs to involve faculty and their perspective as to how OPMs are delivering online learning at scale that, that frankly many of our universities just don't have the resources for right now. So I, I follow that hype, Megan, and, and the rest of you just because uh, you know, I'm concerned that we may be exaggerating some of you know, these ideas about what OPMs are and, and how they're supporting institutions and, and students. And let's you know, get the accreditation community together and the evaluator community together to look at how this is functioning in effective and constructive ways for our learners. You know, you used a, you, there was a one word you said, Leah, that I was gonna jump, jump on and that was scale. Um, we learned, um, we learned some things during COVID and we, we got reminded of some things that perhaps some of us thought we had solved. Uh, we certainly learned that the digital divide is real. It still exists. There are people that don't have broadband. There are people that don't have laptops. So we found colleges and universities literally throwing money at laptops and Chromebooks to make those available to students. And so we did that as a part of COVID. And now we're coming out of COVID. Are we gonna not do that anymore for students? Is that fair? We were doing it, now we're not doing it. Um, that's a pretty interesting thing. We also got reminded that something we all knew that online learning is not for everyone. And when we shifted everyone over there, we had some students that needed some additional help and, and, and rightly so. So, so I think we, we got reminded of some things and, and I think uh, those are good things to know, but, I, but it comes back to all the things that we did to make, um, to make education possible for students during the pandemic. We took extraordinary measure, measures in serving students. And now the fundamental question is, are we no longer gonna do that? Which seems fundamentally wrong. We helped students, we provided resource to students when they needed it, and they progressed and they learned in difficult circumstances. And so now we're coming out of that, so we're not going to do that anymore, and that seems somehow out of place. So I think we've got to come to grips with that. We're also trying to figure out how to pay for all the things that we did during COVID, which is another struggle for our institutions. So I would, I would add to that, um, my word for 2023 is optimism because sometimes I can sound like a, a fatalist, um, but um, fully optimistically, right? Like there are some things that were, that were and are hype, but I think lots of things are hype until it's policy. Lots of things are hype until it's practice. So I'm going to say that like all of the equity talk um, that emerged during the pandemic is hype until it's policy. It's hype until it's practice. All of the care, um, the thoughts of self-care and um, you know, employee-based care spaces and all of this, it's all hype until it's policy. So if it's just something that's emerging in a moment at your institution, like there are wellness spaces, wellness fountains and all of this for a month or for a year, and then it's taken away as soon as we have to consider budget. So then it's not integrated into what we really think about how to serve. I think it's all hype until it's policy and practice. Um, so um, I'm, I'm optimistic, though, that I think there are a lot of organizations trying to make these things policy. Um, and so moving things out of the space of being hype. I think people are really ambitious and, and there are a lot of leaders and a lot of workers who are, you know, very committed to creating equity, equitable, healthy organizations and workplaces. And um, I'm looking forward to see what the outcomes of sustained effort in this space looks like. Um, and I also think it's 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 time to start thinking about how the care for employee bases in higher education really impacts student learning. Um, so if we're if we're not really conscientious when we talk about 
coming on site, it's not just about what's happening for the student experience of learning, it's also what's happening for, you know, faculty and advisors and enrollment counselors, right? If we're not thinking about well being for all employees um, that provide services that then impact the student experience, then I think we're going to find ourselves falling short of the glory that we're trying to create in our organization. So, um, but again, Looking forward to the ways in which people are going to turn the hype into reality and sustain practice um, in the future. I like that optimism. Thank you. Um, and I, I agree. I think there was so much of we just kept moving the finish line and just put our heads down and kept trying to get through the pandemic and then the post pandemic. And now we're post post pandemic. Um, I think it's time to just kind of step back and do what we need to do for our team so that we can better serve learners. Um, I had a meeting with one, one person and she said, it's time to get serious. Like, I just want to crack down. I want my team to get serious. And I said, I, th I think there, there's a balance there, right? Like we, we have been serious. We've just been sort of reactive. And now I think we're trying to be proactive. And if that's serious, then that that's great. But we have to best serve everybody so that we can ultimately serve the students, right? So I, I, I'm with you, Shantae. I'm optimistic. I think it's going to be a great year. Um, I, I'm, I'm hopeful. Just, uh, <laughs> no, sorry. Ahead, just, no, I, I just wanted to double down on something that, a point that John made that I think was is just so critical and has, has opened my eyes. Um, and it's about how when we were in the pandemic, we, we had all these supports for everybody because we were in crisis. We were in crisis, but now we're not. We are not, right? But we fail to realize that just because, like, to, to, to say we are not is tremendous privilege and that students, there are still students in crisis, right? And it's it's not a collective crisis anymore. It's personal. You know, maybe they, yeah, we're not all in a pandemic anymore, but maybe they lost a family member. Maybe they lost a job. Maybe they lost, you know, and so the way, what we learned during the pandemic was how to respond to crisis, right? But like, like John said, how do we carry that learn, learning um, and, and that empathy that we should have gathered, right? And realize that just because we're not there anymore collectively, like there are, that doesn't mean that everybody's now fine, you know? Um, and so I just, John, I just thought that point was, really important and poignant and something that we we've, we've got to hold on to um we knew what it took to we knew how to handle it when we were all going through it together we knew what to do you know but now that we don't feel like we're going through it anymore doesn't mean that we ignore the fact that other people still are in that really difficult place every single day you know and and they're the people in our classrooms and sometimes it's not even just the students sometimes it's faculty Sometimes it's staff, you know, Shantae, to your point, and how are we all taking care of ourselves um, throughout this, this the year of 2023 and beyond? Well, yeah, I want to add on to that. I, I'm cautiously optimistic, and I say that because I know how slowly and difficult it is to make change in higher education happen. But I also know that what, what the pandemic did is it softened things up. It broke a few walls down and people be, were able to see, well, look what we could do if we really wanted to do this. And so I think it, it opened up some real good conversations at the institutional level and the state level about, well, why are we requiring this and this and this? We didn't do it over there and nothing happened. It worked fine. So maybe we should rethink what we're doing. And I think it's an opportunity right now to not all of a sudden spring 100% back, but to think about what did we learn and now build a little more intentionally forward. And certainly all the conversations in the Chronicle and Insider Education about the business model of higher education and now it's in crisis. And I mean, there could be no better time to have this conversation and think about it. Um, I, was, I was reading not long ago, it's another question that I've had for some time, which is, is the product that higher education is currently offering as packaged the right product? And, and, I, and I just finished reading uh, an article that came out of Burning Glass that calls the, the degree reset. And basically it's about a number of employers, well-known and large employers who are saying, 
you know what, we're going to hire people and train them. And if they get a degree while they're here, that's great, but we're not going to require that degree up front to employ them. And so that's another conversation that we would not have had five years ago. Um, and we're seeing cheaper credentials and more competition in the workplace from outside education providers. And so it may be that all of this together is enough pressure to really make us think more boldly about what the future of learning and what the future of higher education is really going to be about, uh, particularly in face of all these technological tools as well, adding more pressure. So I think it's a great time. It's, it's a very exciting time to have this conversation if we can just have the conversation, which I hope we will. Can I add that it's my hope that this optimism that we're all talking about can inform the policymaking side of this that we can have really good conversations about the regulatory framework that delivers financial aid services to our students, that creates resources for institutions, that possibly reconstructs the degree and how we finance that degree through student aid packages. If, if we could have these conversations at the policy setting levels, I think that could be incredibly uh, productive and positive um, for students in the United States. And I love that we're talking about resetting even our notion of the degree, because what I hear from students is if I graduate with a degree, but I don't have a job or I have so much debt that even whatever job I get doesn't really, I, I, all my money is going towards paying off student loans. The degree did nothing like I don't see the value of the degree. Right. And so I think, you know, it's, you know, like we've been saying, it's just time to have that conversation. What does success even look like? You know, because for a lot of people, it's not about the degree. It's about making a living wage. It's about being able to support their family, you know, your, your family. Um, and so, you know, are we actually delivering on, you know, the things that students actually come to higher education for? And, and that's, that's so important. Like, I'm sorry, Leah. No, no, no. I was just thinking somebody needs to set up this as a testimony panel for, for Congress. <laughs> Yeah, because like the definition of success, even like who's defining that, like one internal conversation we're having is we're a self-paced organization, right? So students, we sell it as you can pace, pace yourself however you want to come through the doors of WGU and you can finish a degree how you set up the time to finish it, right? Except that we also measure how quickly you do it as if that's a way to say you've succeeded. But if it took me four years and that's the pace I wanted to, as opposed to two years, because that's the pace I needed to, what's the definition of success, right? So this, I'm always so excited to be a part of this because I have so much to like think about and stew over after these conversations, but thank you. I, I, I'm just stimulated right now. This is Me too, I'm, I'm optimistic, I'm hopeful, and we are about out of time. So I'm gonna hand it back over to Kim, but as always, I just love this brain trust and appreciate you giving so much time to our community. So thank you, uh, Kim. Um, thank you so much to our panelists for sharing your ex expertise, insights, and things to look for in 2023. If you'd like to reach out to any of them directly, um, their contact information is listed here. We will be sharing the recording out with registrants in a follow-up email, and it will also be posted on our website um, as soon as possible. You can learn more about WCET, our work, and upcoming events on our website. We'll be announcing some new webcasts very soon. Um, we do have two events coming up for WCET members. I forgot to put one on a slide. Um, it's actually tomorrow, a closer conversation tomorrow at Noon Mountain, positioning your institution with industry for a sustainable workforce. Um, I'll include the link on our follow-up email um, as soon as possible. Um, and you can also find it on your website if you want, on our website if you want to register for it. Um, and then our virtual summit is coming up on March 9th. It's a half day event exploring the elements of evolving business models of higher education. Um, again, it's exclusively for WCUT members. It's a great professional development opportunity and we hope you can join us for that. Um, finally, I'd like to thank our sponsors um, and our supporting members that make our work here at WCUT possible. Thank you so much for attending today's webinar. And we hope to see you again very soon. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Thanks. Have a great day.